Good evening and welcome to Scotland at 7. It's Thursday the 7th of March. My name is Brian Liddy and I'm joined this evening by um, Linda Fabiani. Um, Linda, um, you need no introduction as you're a frequent guest and supporter of Broadcast in Scotland and we thank you for that. Um, you were an MSP for East Kilbride and Deputy Presiding Officer and you're now retired, which means you've got more time to, to spend with us, so that's great. Welcome. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so, um, we'll start with our again sadly routine Ukraine update and today is day 743. The Ukrainian military will stabilise the battlefield situation shortly and aims to form units for counter-offensive actions later this year, according to Lieutenant General Alexander Pavelok, commander of ground forces. He said work was underway to withdraw military units and restore their combat potential. Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, has previously said Russia will try to mount a new offensive this spring or summer, but Kyiv has a battlefield plan of its own. Ukrainian military spokesperson Dmitry Likhovy told national television on Wednesday that Russia forces, Russian forces were unable to gain new ground near Ad Avdivka. Sweden has officially become the 32nd member of NATO today, a development entirely due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. UK Foreign Minister David Cameron will discuss boosting support for Ukraine in talks with his German counterpart Annalena Baerbock in Berlin today. High oil prices, sanctions sanction evasion and state investment are providing Russia with enough resources to fight on Ukraine at the current intensity for at least two more years, Lithuanian intelligence agencies have said. In a report, they add that Russian intelligence is driving efforts to evade sanctions on its defence industry. Russia is openly supplied with weapons and ammunition by only Iran and North Korea, but China has become its largest supplier of microchips and the yuan now uh, the main currency for Russia's international transactions, the intelligence agencies say. A deadly Russian missile strike on the Ukrainian port city of Edessa appeared to land near Volodymyr Zelensky and visiting Greek Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis, who described the moment of the bombardment as intense. The UK is prepared to loan Ukraine all frozen Russian central bank assets in the UK on the basis that Russia will be forced to pay reparations to Ukraine at the end of the war, Foreign Secretary David Cameron has said. He said the assets would be used as surety for the payment of the reparations. Ukraine stepped up its attacks behind Russian lines with the apparent car bomb killing of a Russian election official in the Russian-occupied city of Berdyansk, and two drones struck the Mikhailovsky GOK iron ore refinery in Russia's Kursk region, where an industrial fuel tank exploded. Ukrainian military intelligence was responsible for the iron plant attack, a source told Reuters. A reporter for the independent Russian news outlet Rus News has been sentenced to seven years in prison for articles he wrote about alleged Russian war crimes in Ukraine, his publication said. Roman Ivanov was convicted of publishing fake news about the Russian army under wartime censorship. Linda, was there anything there that you'd, you'd like to comment on? Oh gosh, there's so much, isn't there, and still going on. I was really interested uh, to hear the Swedish representative talking today um, about, you know, the fact that they've become the 32nd uh, member of NATO. And you know, what he was saying was that uh, prior to the Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine, um, that uh, only, I think he said, less than 30% of the population uh, were supportive of joining NATO. And since the Russian invasion, it's up to three quarters. Three quarters of the population wanted to become NATO members. And I, I think that shows the real threat that people feel from what's happening in Ukraine. And, uh, you know, and if allowed just to happen, could expand further to under other countries in the region. So, it really struck home with me that very often being a, a nation on an island, as, as Scotland is, um, we don't have the same fears and intensity 
of fear of shifting borders and people coming over the border to invade you that folk in mainland Europe have. And I think it's very marked that the civilian population in Sweden, they know their history and they see a real threat by what's happening here and have wanted to join with the allies um, to have a sort of united, united front in Europe standing for democracy. So I found that extremely interesting in the way that public opinion in Sweden shifted. Um, so yeah, it, it makes you realise just how scary that is when you're living beside it. Yes, the um, island nations, you know, I'm, I'm, I suppose the closest we've got to it is the land border that we share with the with the EU um, in Northern Ireland and Ireland. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and we'll be talking about Sweden later on, so we can, um, mm. so I'll move on to the Israel-Gaza latest. At least 30,800 Palestinians have been killed and 72,298 have been wounded in Gaza since the 7th of October, according to the latest figures from the Gaza Health Ministry. In addition, the Palestinian Authority Ministry the, the Palestinian Authority, authority forgive me, the Palestinian Authority Ministry of Health has said that 424 Palestinians have now been killed by Israeli security forces or settlers in the Israeli occupied West Bank since the 7th of October. A Hamas statement has confirmed that talks over a deal with Israel will continue despite a Hamas delegation leaving Cairo where talks were being held and a senior Hamas official claiming that Israel had thwarted any deal. Israeli government spokesperson David Menser claimed that it is Hamas who is a stumbling block right now by not telling us who is alive and who they have in their custody. In its latest operational update, Israel's military says it continues operations against terrorist infrastructure and operatives in Khan Yunus and the central Gaza Strip. Benjamin Netanyahu said Israel will push on with its offensive in Gaza, including in Rafah, regardless of international pressure. The health ministry in Gaza said 47 bodies of pal Palestinians killed by Israel earlier in its military offensive have been returned today. Israel's foreign minister, Is Israel Katz, is reported to have instructed diplomats to push calls for the UN to declare Hamas a terrorist organisation in the wake of a UN report on sexual violence occurring during and after the 7th of October attacks inside southern Israel. Turkey's Red Crescent is sending its biggest aid shipment yet to Gaza via Egypt, with a ship carrying about 3,000 tonnes of food, medicine and equipment leaving the Egyptian port of Al-Arish. Lair Hayat, spokesperson for Israel's Foreign Affairs Ministry, has accused South Africa of acting as the legal arm of Hamas in an attempt to undermine Israel's inherent right to defend itself and its citizens and to release all of the hostages. South Africa has been pressing the International Court of Justice in The Hague to order Israel into a ceasefire. Three crew members of the True Confidence dry bulk carrier were killed in a missile attack off Yemen on Wednesday, the owners and manager of the ship confirmed in a statement on Thursday. Malaysia's Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim has criticised the West for its attitude to the situation in Gaza during a speech in Australia. He said the West had been so vociferous, vehement and unequivocal in the condemnation of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but utterly silent on the relentless bloodletting inflicted on innocent men, women and children of Gaza. Anwar said it would be foolish to think these inconsistencies would go unnoticed. In his State of the Union speech, President Biden will announce that US forces will build a temporary port on the Gaza shoreline in the next few weeks to allow delivery of humanitarian aid on a large scale. A senior US official said today, we are not waiting on the Israelis. This is a moment for American leadership. Reflecting growing frustration of what is seen in Washington as Israeli obstruction of road deliveries on a substantial scale. Linda, the same question. Is there anything there that you'd like to comment on? Well, I, I was really, really interested in Biden's move um, that's been reported as going to be announced in that State of the Union speech that you mentioned. 
um, the building of court. I understand they're going to do it from the sea. Um, they're going to build a temporary port, temporary pier, for aid, uh, large amounts of aid, to come in uh, unhindered with uh, Larnaca and Cyprus being the the point that the convoys or boats will leave from. So I was really pleased to hear that, Brian, because it seems to be a bit of a shift in the US thinking. And I know, I understand President Biden has come under pressure from folk in his own uh, team uh, to do this, but I'm, I'm so pleased to hear it. I understand, too, that um, the Israelis will be able to inspect the aid convoys in Larnaca. Uh, before they leave. So let's hope that that gets some substantial aid through to these people because we also read that um, children are starving. There's all these deaths, there's all these injuries, people being maimed and people starving, children starving in the streets. Absolutely horrendous. So the more that can happen there, the better. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what Trump makes of that. Um, we shall see what he responds to it after the State of the Union speech. So that, that was the main thing that uh, I picked up today, other than my ongoing concern about the West Bank, you know, the increased um, settlement in the West Bank, all going on under cover of what's happening in Gaza, which is the main uh, point of news stories. So I know there's some intrepid journalists following that up all the time and more power to them for doing that. Thank you, Linda. Um, the next item is um, the Cabinet Secretary for Justice and Home Affairs, Angela Constance, has announced that there will be an independent judge-led statutory public inquiry will take place into the investigation of Emma Caldwell's murder in 2005. In a statement to the Scottish Parliament, the Justice Secretary told MSPs that it was time to apply fresh scrutiny to the case to understand what went wrong, to ensure lessons are learned for the future and to provide answers to the victims and survivors involved. Further details will be set out once live legal proceedings in the case have concluded and a chair of the inquiry has been appointed. Ministers will work alongside the Chair and Emma's family in setting the, and agreeing the terms of reference for the inquiry. The decision to hold a public inquiry was reached after the First Minister and Justice Secretary held discussions with Emma's family, including her mother, Margaret Caldwell, on Tuesday this week. The Justice Secretary said, Margaret Caldwell and her family have waited far too long to get justice for Emma. I have expressed directly to them on behalf of the Scottish Government how deeply sorry we are for their loss and for the pain and grief they have had to endure. She continued, 19 years have elapsed since Emma's murder and the conviction, showing serious failings occurred in the investigation. Given this, along with the gravity of the case, the length of time that it took for justice to be served for so many women and the horrific extent of the sexual violence suffered by the victims and survivors, the case for holding a public inquiry is overwhelming. She said the family want to have answers and deserve nothing less. The First Minister made clear that we would give serious consideration to the Caldwell family's call for a public inquiry after hearing directly from Margaret Caldwell and her family and pledged we would do so quickly. I am glad that, that now we have been able to answer their call by announcing that we will set up a public inquiry. Um, Linda, I mean, this, this is a horrific mm -hmm. murder case. Um, and we should, yeah, we should remind viewers that it is still a live case, um, so we have to be careful. But as the, as the item said, the aim of this report is to apply fresh scrutiny to the case to understand what went wrong and provide answers to Emma's family and loved mm -hmm. ones. And, and so much went wrong. Um, you, you've got experience in chairing committees in Holyrood, so I was wondering if I could yeah. ask what your first thoughts would be if the First Minister were to come to you and ask you to chair this report. How would you, how would you tackle it, and, and or who would you be calling on to contribute, do you think? Oh, my. Well, I think, um, you know, first of all, the, the first thing that would be done in that case would be to be very aware, as you already mentioned, of uh, any legal restrictions that are there in terms of what can be public and what can be private. Now, I know it's a public inquiry that's been announced following all uh, relevant legal considerations, 
But even in these cases, very often, there are legal constraints on what can be made public. So that would be the first thing. And of course, you know, having to acquaint oneself and with all the detail possible that is there um, and then make that decision about who you want to talk to, who you want to call. I mean, I'm, I'm very aware that there are still ongoing legal proceedings, Brian. So you know, one com you know, something I, I would like to say, um, which has relevance for Emma's case and relevance for others, is that even as short a time ago as, what, 2005, my own view, and I know it's shared by many others, is that um, there was never the same urgency, I believe, and this may sound controversial, urgency given to um, crimes against those in the sex industry. You know, so if um, a, a sex worker ended up being badly beaten or dead, my view is that there was never the same care and attention given uh, in solving these crimes. I don't think it was just the police that were to blame for that. I think society generally um, has a lot to answer for in that regard. And we really have come on in quite big strides uh, over the last you know, 20 years, if you like. Uh, 10 years, even, maybe not as much as 20. I think we have come on there. But we should always be aware that there is still stigma attached to those who work in the sex industry. Um, women don't even have to do that to have a stigma to them. They don't have to be paid sex workers. We all know about the misogyny that exists uh, in society. Uh, we have seen it in abundance in the, the Met, the Metropolitan Police. And we had a, a head of Police Scotland fairly recently saying that it still does exist in Police Scotland. So that's another element. I think that a public inquiry will bring out. But I'm very, very conscious that we have these things. I remember the Surjit Singh Chokar case back oh, 20 years or so, uh, when it was institutional racism that was the issue that uh, came out in the reporting of that when there were inquiries held. And I think there is still a degree of institutional racism. Uh, and certainly there's institutional sexism and misogyny. So that has to be examined very, very thoroughly. And lots of measures put in place uh, to ensure that anyone who suffers a violent crime has the right to have that violent crime properly addressed and great care taken. So that's the basis for everything I'm thinking about this. Um, thanks, Linda. I mean, yeah, we don't have much time left, but yeah, the other night we were, I was speaking to Fatima Joji here on, um, on or was it Sunday on broadcasting um, the full Scottish, and we talked about um, institutional misogyny as as well, and and you mentioned um, sex workers. We, we we touched on one example where um, one sex worker who had been abused by the murderer went went to the police to ask for help, and she ended up in a police cell. Um, which just seems incredible. You go to the police for help and they lock you up. Um, but, mm -hmm. but we'd, we'd better move on. Um, so the OBR has warned that Brexit continues to leave a hole in the UK economy. In its analysis of the UK budget, the Office for Budget Responsibility warned that the UK trade intensity exports plus imports divided by GDP has not recovered in line with other G7 countries since the pandemic. We continue to expect that Brexit will reduce the UK's potential GDP by 4% in the long run by lowering the trade, in, the, the trade intensity of the economy. Commenting SNP Trade and Business spokesperson Richard Thompson MP said, Brexit has been a disaster for Scotland and the OBR analysis shows it continues to blow a massive hole in the UK economy, costing Scotland billions of pounds in lost trade, investment and economic growth. Neither Rishi Sunak or Keir Starmer can have any credibility on the economy when they are both wedded to Brexit 
which is one of the biggest factors wrecking the UK economy and has set the UK on a path to long-term decline. He continued, The SNP is the only party offering people in Scotland the opportunity to rejoin the EU and it's clear that independence is Scotland's only route back to the EU prosperity and sustained economic growth. Um, Linda, when I was doing a wee bit digging for this, um, I did a web search just for the, um, the words OBR, Brexit and UK economy and I got a st a pages of news items with almost exactly the same headline that we're reporting this evening going back to the likes of 2019. There was one piece from the 26th of March 2023 where OBR Chair, Chair Richard Hughes said that leaving the EU would cause a 4% reduction to the UK economy and he went on to say that 4% would be um, a shock to the UK economy in the order of magnitude of a pandemic or the, the energy crisis. Does that surprise mm. you? No, it doesn't, because, I, you know, I, I think any sensible commentator, independent commentator, um, was saying right from the start that Brexit would be a disaster. And it's, it appears it's had a particular impact in Scotland. So... And then, of course, we had the pandemic and all focus was on the pandemic and anything that was going on with the economy, uh, Westminster blamed on the pandemic. We're moving on from that. So it's now becoming apparent again that Brexit has been a huge issue. And, you know, it's, it's got a real effect in Scotland. We're, we're hearing these reports all the time. Uh, but they keep looking at these targets when they're doing the the budgets and, and I am so sceptical about these arbitrary targets that they keep coming up with because they decide the target, you know, what comes first, the actual action or, you know, do they decide what they can do there for the set a target rather than looking at what where we should be at. I would far rather we were focusing on the outcomes for people because all the commentators um, are saying that people are, you know, households are less well off now than they have been for a long, long time and it's going to get worse. I mean, they're still talking about a 4% reduction in potential GDP. We hear the UK government talking yesterday, Mr Hunt was going on about how well we're doing compared to everybody else. It's just not the case. When you look at how the OBR have reported that we're way behind the comparable G7 country. So... Do you know, Brian, I can't remember what the question you asked me was. I went away off on one. <laughs> so I don't know was, if I answered you or not. It was really just to say, are you surprised that people have been saying this is what's going to happen if, if no, Britain leaves no, the EU? You know, that was all, really. It's, it seems, just seems like, like we've heard it all before for years now. Um, well, yeah. And then, you know, when I mentioned the effect in Scotland... Um, it's not just the Brexit effect that's hammering Scotland. I don't know if you're going to come on to it, Brian, but, you know, that it, that's what... I think they've worked out it's 20.5 or 6 billion that they're going to be taking uh, from the northeast of Scotland to support the Treasury. You know, and it's like a repeat of history. It's like back when oil was first discovered, instead of setting up a wealth fund like Norway did, um, you know, for the benefit and the well-being of the population. They just wheat the money away to plug their gaps, you know, the financial gaps. Um, and I think it was their, I can't, was it their borrowing? I think at the time it was um, the balance of payments stuff that they were sorting out. And now they're, taking, now they're taking away the money again, not doing anything constructive with it, it's just to shore up the Treasury. And Scotland just gets hammered every time. Uh, oh, there's a resource, we'll grab it. Uh, yeah. And we could do so much more. If we're an independent country, we could do so much more yeah. uh, with our and um, yeah, you're right. I mean, time really has against us, but I think it probably is worth touching. I mean, that I think the the windfall tax is is the key. Um, so if you go back to Douglas mm -hmm. Ross's pre pre budget, apparently he had a pre budget stushy with the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, because Douglas Ross um, threatened to quit as leader over um, Oliver um, mm -hmm. Hunt's plan for an oil and gas windfall tax. Hunt mm -hmm. wants one, Ross doesn't. Labour um, want a windfall tax so that they can, the SNP say, so that they can spend it on 
um, power st nuclear power stations in England. <laughs> the SNP want a windfall tax so that they can invest it in Scotland and renewable energies. And yet, I don't, yeah, so that thing about everybody wants one apart from Douglas Ross. Um, <laughs> so I don't know, what does that tell you? I could give you a minute on that if you want. Well, I mean, I thought it was really interesting. I, I, I was following that stuff. And it just shows that Douglas Ross is just um, a wee sort of supervisor in a branch office. He's uh, not at all important in the greater scheme of things as far as uh, Westminster Tories are concerned. It's just the same as the Labour Party, you know. Um, Westminster matters. Scotland doesn't actually matter. We'll stick somebody in charge and we'll throw them a sweetie every now and then, make them look important. But when push comes to shove, don't even bother consulting them. So there you go. That's why, you know, we're yeah. far better off with representatives whose sole priority is Scotland, and that's what the SNP is. Uh, that's what the, the Greens are. So, not yeah. sole priority. Yeah, uh, and you know, we, we obviously have care for others as well. But uh, actually, the responsibility of any government is to look after their own folk. Um, and the Westminster parties don't look after the folk in Scotland. Yes, and, and just just one last before before we go. Um, but for, uh, the first minister today uh, told Douglas Ross that he'd been left out to dry by his colleagues in Westminster, right. and I wonder if that's one of the reasons why Ms. Mr. Ross was incredibly touchy and quite um, angry um, in t today's first minister's questions. It's worth checking well, out. If I you didn't see it, it, but he's, he's mm. always angry. He's an angry wee man. Always has been. More so, uh, than, more so, so than usual today, I would say. He's even more angry. So, I would well, say so. Yeah. Today then. <laughs> yeah, so check it out. So, the next item is uh, Jeremy Hunt and Rachel Reeves are joined in a conspiracy of silence over tens of billions of pounds in tough tax and spending choices, with the next government likely to inherit the toughest outlook for the public finances in 80 years, a leading economics think tank has warned. The Institute for Fiscal Studies said the Chancellor's budget on Wednesday had laid the ground for staggeringly hard choices due after the general election for whichever party forms the next government. The experts on the UK's public finances said Hunt had earmarked cut, cuts to spending. Forgive me there, I better enunciate that more clearly. The experts on the UK's public finances said Hunt had earmarked cuts to spending on public services outside health, defence and education worth £20 billion, while driving up national debt levels within the narrowest of margins to meet his self-imposed fiscal rule. Hunt's ambition would cost more than four, four, £40 billion, pounds, according to the IFS, as a starting point of tens of billions of pounds in further uncosted measures floated by the Tories, during, including an increase in defence spending and planned increases in fuel duty. In stinging remarks about the government, IFS Director Paul Johnson said Hunt had laid the ground so that the next Parliament could well prove to be the most difficult of any in 80 years for a Chancellor wanting to bring down debt. Commentating, SNP economy spokesperson Drew Hendry MP said, It's now clear the UK is facing another decade of damaging Westminster austerity cuts, with both Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer planning to take the axe to public services and choke off economic growth by failing to invest. Starmer is wrong to copy the Tories on imposing swinging cuts and to rule out taxing the riches to protect services. With around £20 billion of Westminster cuts coming down the line, the Tories and Labour Party must come clean on where the axe will fall, he said. Um, so, Linda, I, I'd like to take you back in time for this one, to, uh, maybe oh. to, to, yeah, to around the year 2000. I think I'm right in saying that at that time you, would, you were yet to enter Holyrood as an MSP. Um, no, but, I was there then. Oh, were you there then? Okay, I'll be a bit yeah, further then if you want. Um, but let's say that back then somebody predicted that in 2024, following 14 years of Tory government, that the UK would, would be the first parliament in modern history to have a fall in living standards, with household incomes on course to fall despite national insurance cuts, as the Resolution Foundation have said. And they're right wing. So would, mm -hmm. you, have, would you have believed that the person that told you the situation that we were in back then? Oh, well, yeah, it's a resolution. Yeah, the Resolution Foundation are right wing, yes. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I think they are. I thought, uh, yeah, I think so, I've got my, my, my organisations mixed up there. Um, well, sorry. well, you know, no matter whether organisations are right-wing or left-wing, um, you know, when they're coming out, coming out with stuff 
like this, it's time to sit up to take notice. Uh, and uh, would I have expected it? I would have expected it if somebody had told me there'd be a Tory government for, for 14 years, yes, uh, I would have. Because, uh, you know, nothing surprises me with them. Um, would I have expected it? Do you know, I thought we'd be independent by... I, I thought we'd have been independent by then, Brian, so hey-ho. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's interesting what the IFS have said. They've said lots of stuff. They've said there's a historically high tax burden. They've said, as you said, household incomes expected to fall more in the current two years than at any point in living memory. Now, when I think back to uh, the 70s, 80s, and they're saying any point in living memory, that's pretty horrendous. Uh, household income set to be lower than autumn 2019 levels this autumn. That's pre-COVID. But the really worrying thing is that we have a Conservative Party and a Labour Party and you couldn't slip a, a credit card, of which they've got plenty, uh, between their policies. So that if would seem extremely worrying if we are still in the UK uh, for any length of time. doesn't bode well for Scotland at all. Uh, the Resolution Foundation, they've actually come up with figures that talk about 8 million pensioners who pay income tax are going to be worse off as well. I think they're, they're talking about a £1,000 average uh, a year. So we've got a really hard time going on. Hard for Scotland again. I mean, the other thing that bothers me is Scotland relies very much on small and medium enterprises, you know, small businesses who are the backbone uh, of our economy. And it was quite fascinating to me that the Confederation of British Industry, all the big boys, uh, they have welcomed the budget. Whereas the Federation of Small Businesses is pretty despondent uh, about the effect on small and medium businesses. So again, that's hard for Scotland. Uh, so back to, would I have been surprised back in 2000? Not if I thought there was going to be a Tory government. What I do find surprising though, and sad, is that I don't see it going to be any different with a Labour government either in the UK. Thank you, Lyndon. My apologies because I'm, yeah, I actually asked you the, the question for the next item there and, um, and I, I, I should make an apology also to the Resolution Foundation that they are not right wing. The Resolution Foundation is an independent British think tank. They were established in 2005 with the stated aim to improve the standard of living to, for low and middle income families. They've got an A rating for transparency from the Who Funds You project. The right wing think tank that I had in mind was the IF. Um, the, yeah, the IFS, the Institute for Fiscal Studies, and the, my question to you was supposed to be: Is this um, is this proof that um, that that there's that if you vote Labour you get Tory, or um, but we'd, we'd better we'd better move on before I make you even more of a, a mess of. Um, so the next item is: Household incomes are on course to fall for the first time over the course of a Parliament, which the the question was asking you previously. Household incomes are on course to fall for, for a first time over the course of a parliament despite Jeremy Hunt's national insurance cuts, the Resolution Foundation think tank has said in its assessment of the Chancellor's budget. Amid almost two decades of falling real wages, the Foundation said that after adjusting for inflation, household disposable incomes were poised to fall by 0.9% between 2019 and the end of 2024. They quoted the first parliament in modern history to see a fall in living standards. The foundation said Hunt's likely last budget before the general election, delivered on Wednesday, showed that this had been a parliament of flatlining growth, failing living standards, sorry, falling living standards and notable redistribution from the old and the rich to the young and the poor. Analysis overnight by the foundation showed that a long period when tax policy was skewed to supporting older generations had come to an end, with Hunt targeting households headed by someone aged between 18 and 45 with the biggest gains. The report said this group would benefit on average by £590, compared with an average loss of £770 for those aged 66 and over. 
Torsten Bell, the chief executive of the Resolution Foundation, said the Chancellor had constructed a budget that offered a £9 billion tax reduction before a general election expected this year. But with £19 billion of tax rises to follow in subsequent years in its assessment of the public finances, the Office for Budget Responsibility, the Treasury's official forecaster, said the Chancellor had increased borrowing to pay for most of his tax cuts, using up all of the £13 billion reduction in borrowing costs. Forgive me, Linda, because I, not only did I mm -hmm. ask the, the wrong question to the wrong item, <laughs> but I think I didn't maybe read that, enunciate that very clearly. Um, can you maybe um, rescue me here? What do you think of this one? Feel free to go back in time if you want. Um. <laughs> Do you know, I have long said, Brian, that what we have in Westminster is a club of two parties. And one party, be it the Tories or Labour, get a shot and they do their bit for a few years. And then governments lose, oppositions don't win. So the government loses and the other side come in. And they more or less do the same. I mean, back in 1997, Labour came to power, promising to keep to Tory spending plans, uh, if you remember. So they keep the status quo generally and share power uh, from one to the other. So, you know, the fact that, um, I think you're on to Resolution Foundation, I think it was the IFS guy who said that... Uh, you know, neither of them are being honest and transparent about what they're going to have to do, whoever wins the election. Um, and I, I think that is just proof of the fact that they know how things are going to go um, and they play the game. So big problem with Westminster is that you have this two-party state. And of course, when it came to the idea of uh, proportional representation, so there could be more transparency, more discussion and better representation for people. The Lib Dems having a shot in government bottled that. I mean, they had the referendum, but they didn't work for it. So we ended up just with the same old system. Add to that uh, a House of Unelected Lords, which is archaic in the extreme. And you have the absolute mess that is Westminster. You have a bunch of people uh, that form the establishment looking after their own because you can bet your bottom dollar that the people that are all putting these policies in place aren't going to lose through any of them. Uh, so that is where we're at. And uh, you know, what we need is a, a completely new kind of system that looks at the well-being of a nation, that looks um, to be helping households in the best possible way. It's not going to happen through the UK. There's nobody there that's going to do that. Keir Starmer quite clearly is not going to do that. And it's been pointed out over and over again uh, by folk like the Resolution Foundation in their own way of doing so. And nothing has changed. I believe that's why they both, again, both in the same sheet when it comes to a referendum for Scotland and people's right in Scotland to decide their own future, neither of these parties are willing to take the chance that they lose Scotland because then they wouldn't have the 20 billion from the North Sea windfall tax, for example, and uh, they wouldn't have the contribution that Scotland makes even beyond that. So that's my ongoing despair, Brian. I said to you earlier that I thought we'd have been independent by now. The disappointment in my life is the fact that we're not, but it doesn't mean we can't stop arguing for it, making the case for it, and getting more people in Scotland behind us than the low 50% that there is just now. Yeah, and as I said, um, time is against us, but do you think it's telling that this item about falling living standards is coming at a time when the Scottish Government is being praised for um, raising th children out of poverty? So this is just going to take the carpet out, out from under the work that they're trying to do? Well, you know, the, the Scottish block grant is falling in real terms. Uh, and that can only get worse, uh, you know, with with everything we've been hearing about tonight. Um, I don't think they've worked out the consequentials that will come yet in total from what the Chancellor has announced. But we do know um, that it's getting harder and harder for any Scottish government to do the things that they want to do. Their choices are being cut. And I would say great praise 
um, for our current Scottish Government, that's the uh, SNP and the Greens, for having pushed for the Scottish Child Payment, which all the commentators who are involved in the field have said has made a difference. We would so much like to do more, I'm sure. Uh, but the fact that we've done that in the face of the rest is pretty good going. Um, but again, there's going to be very hard choices for the Scottish Government coming further down the line. OK, thank you, Linda. The next item is opportunities to revive the UK's flagging economy by boosting green industry were missed in one of the least green budgets of recent years, experts have said. Several said this failure to recognise one of the fastest expanding areas of business, that's the net zero economy, grew by 9% um, in key areas last year, while the rest of the economy was stagnant, according to CBI estimates that would drag down the UK in the short and long term. Alistair Johnston of the Energy and Climate Intelligence Unit said, at the time when Excuse me. At a time when the US and EU are competing over investment in clean industries, there was little here to attract investment. He said this could prove costly, pointing to forecasts from the Office for Budget Responsibility, there they are again, that found instability in the Middle East could drive up energy costs again, leading to a need to borrow fresh billions on top of the government debt already accrued in combating the current gas crisis. He went on to say, speeding up the deployment of renewables, the insulation of homes, the rollout of heat pumps and the uptake of electric vehicles would boost our energy security, Johnson said. None of these received much attention in Wednesday's budget. Instead, the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, opted to freeze fuel duty for a 14th year running, a move likely to benefit richer people and do little for those on low incomes. Real prices have risen annually over the same period, and Jürgen Mayer, a former chief executive of Siemens in the UK, said the move sent the wrong signal. So Brian checks notes and makes sure he's got the right question lined up for this news <laughs> item. So... Um, uh, Caroline Lucas pointed out um, that Hunt did not mention the term climate change once when he set out the government's uh -huh. spring budget um, earlier this week. And she described it as a failure future generations won't forgive while he blew billions on pre-election pre tax giveaways. Um, do you agree with her? Is she right? I absolutely agree with her. Yeah, I do. And I think Caroline Lucas is going to be a huge loss to the parliament. Uh, you know, she's so well respected across across the board and uh, gets listened to. So she will be a huge loss when she retires. I, I hope that the Greens keep that seat. I would like them to get more seats. It would be good to have the Green voice in there, uh, along with the SNP and and others. Uh, so yeah, um, they're, they're letting a huge opportunity go. It's all short termism. It's all about, well, could it be about them perhaps winning the election? I don't know. I think that would be wishful thinking on their part. Um, but it is about uh, populism and not taking the real decisions for the future. And Caroline's right. Uh, they will not be forgiven for that. Scotland's got the capability of being at the forefront of this stuff. The Westminster government's dragging us down all the time. Thank you. Um, uh, and I, I was really hoping to ask you as well, because I mean, this is going to impact Scotland in particular, isn't it? Um, because we're overflowing with renewables and the Scottish gov government's desperate to take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's so much that we could be doing. Uh, you know, back to that windfall tax. Um, you know, we, we could be using that for, for really good diversification uh, and doing good stuff. I mean, I noticed too, uh, I don't know the detail, but I noticed the Greens were talking today about the potential of doing something at Grangemouth, for example. Uh, so yes, there is so much that we could be doing and we're just being hobbled by um, lack of ambition, uh, lack of recognition of what has to be done for the future and short termism. Okay, thank you, Linda. So Sweden, the next item is Sweden has officially become the 32nd member of NATO in a landmark moment for the historically neutral country and the Western Military Alliance. Stockholm's ratification process was finally completed in Washington today as Sweden and Hungary, the last country to ratify Sweden's membership, submitted the necessary documents after a drawn out process that has taken nearly two years. For Sweden, it marks the end of a 20-month long wait that started in May 2022 when it submitted its application to join alongside Finland, prompted by Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February that year. 
Finland became NATO's 31st member last year. Ratification also marks a historic sea change in Sweden's national and international identity as it shifts away from the neutrality that started at the end of the Cold War. The ratification cements NATO's control of the Nordic region with all countries now members and makes the Baltic an entirely NATO sea. The process was completed at about 5.30pm Swedish time when the Swedish Prime Minister Ulf Kristersson and the US Secretary of State Antony Blinken presided at a ceremony in which Sweden's instrument of accession to the alliance was officially deposited at the State Department. Good things come to those who wait, no better example, said Blinken. With all the paperwork done, Sweden's official NATO accession ceremony is expected to be held within days. So, um, Linda, uh, Sweden and NATO have always been allies. They regularly carry out joint exercises. They've cooperated in peace processing, oper peacekeeping um, operations. They've shared information. In 1995, Sweden sent a battalion to the NATO-led peacekeeping force in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So why is it such a big deal that Sweden's now joined NATO? Oh gosh. Um, well, I, I think it's a, it's a big deal for Sweden because I, I spoke earlier about the ordinary punter in, in Sweden, you know. Uh, it must give a better feeling of security that they are firmly members of an alliance that they see as a bulwark against Russia. Now, I understand from what I read that Putin has come out with some comment about there would be recriminations or repercussions or something. Must be so worrying for anybody in the region. So I, th I think it is a big deal that they have signed the dotted line, if you like, to become full members of NATO. I think it's also a big deal that Hungary um, agreed that they should finally. So uh, where does it come from here? I know there are other smaller countries who are... Um, talking and not necessarily about joining NATO uh, but uh, you know who are also forming alliances I heard something earlier about Moldova for example in discussion with I think it might have been France uh, so there's a, a lot happening uh, in that region at the moment and democracies have to stand together in this regard Russia quite clearly isn't a democracy um, with, I mean, not only is it external aggression, it's internal oppression as well. You mentioned something earlier, Brian, about a, another journalist getting jailed for daring to have opinions. Uh, so it's a big deal that democracies stand together. Thanks, Linda. And just to confirm, you said right back at the start of the show that you thought that historically a, minor, a minority of the Swedes had been in favour of NATO yeah. membership before um, Russia invaded nuclear, um, Ukraine and, and now it's a majority. And I just, I've just i got that in my notes as well, so I can confirm Good. that. Good. Yeah. Um, the next item is Hungary's Viktor Orban is putting his chips on the table with a trip to visit Donald Trump as the US and Europe prepare for key elections later this year. The long-time Hungarian Prime Minister, who has faced repeated criticism from the US government over democratic backsliding and his friendly relationship with the Kremlin, will be arriving in the US this week without an invitation from the White House. In an almost unheard of move for a NATO country's leader, he is not expected to meet anyone from the Biden administration. Instead, he's scheduled to speak on Thursday on a panel with the head of a conservative think tank, the Heritage Foundation, before meeting Donald Trump in Florida on Friday. The visit, which comes at a low point in Hungary's post-Cold War relationship with Washington, is being watched closely in foreign policy circles, in part due to the fears that Orban could use his access to the Republican presidential candidate to promote Kremlin talking points on Ukraine. The Hungarian leader has publicly expressed his hopes for a foreign policy shift in Washington and Brussels. Uh, the, the planned meeting with Trump has raised eyebrows in both Budapest and Washington. So again, Brian checks notes and makes sure that he has the right. So, um, Linda, did, did you raise your eyebrows when, when you heard about this meeting? Um, the, the Hungary's Prime Minister hasn't been invited by the White House. Um, it, this isn't really the question I want to ask you. It's a preamble. Do, do you think Putin raised his eyebrows when he heard about this, um, as mm. Orban recently met with Putin? So my real question to you is, do you think, could the two visits be connected? Is Orban working for Putin? Well, I'll tell you what, my brows did raise about 
minute and a half ago, Brian, because I hadn't heard this. This is news to me, breaking news from Brian. Uh, I hadn't heard about this, and yes, my eyebrows were raised. I'm quite horrified at the idea uh, of these two guys sitting there deciding what should happen in the world with their view of it. Um, your question, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, it was planned by Putin and Orban. I mean, I say that just by impressions of what I've ha heard about Orban, what I've read about him. Um, so I think eyebrows will continue to be raised till we hear what's, what comes out after this meeting. I'm also quite stunned at the, the lack of protocol about a foreign head of state visit in the country without speaking to that country's head of state either. It's almost unheard of. Uh, so, yeah, eyebrows raised, still up there, not coming down again. Could the American government refuse Orban entry um, if he doesn't follow? Um... Oh, gosh, I think that would be right up Trump Street, wouldn't it? Yeah. Mm, and they probably. could always build a wall at the exit to the airport, couldn't they? Um, there's, there's certainly, um, when, if, you, if you have a look online, there's certainly a lot of people um, sort of flagging up the fact that um, Trump took the, the nuclear codes to Mar-a-Lago and is rumoured to have shared oh, them Lord. with people. And so um, there's talk about, is that maybe going to be on the table? But um, if it's OK, shall we move on to the next item? Aye, I'm yeah. going to have a good old ponder about this one. That's okay. a stunner. So the evaluation of the proportionate response to crime um, pilot in the north east of Scotland is published today. It recommends the process should be rolled out across the rest of the service. Police Scotland intends to do this on a phased basis with ongoing engagement and evaluation. During a 12-week trial, 5% of crime reports in A Division, that's Aberdeen, Aberdeen, Sharan, Murray, Murray, sorry, were recorded and filed for no further inquiry following an assessment of threat, harm, risk, vulnerability and for proportionate lines of investigation and evidence freeing up to, freeing up 2,657 police officer hours. The process means that in cases where there are no investigative opportunities, such as CCTV or witnesses, callers will be informed about the progress of the report more quickly, rather than waiting days for officers to make contact and inform them of the same outcome. Since the introduction of the process, public satisfaction rates have improved in the North East, while more people who contact the police also said they got an appropriate response. Prior to the pilot, 72% of a division officers reported sorry, prior to the pilot, 72% of A division officers reported they would regularly be allocated crime reports where no proportionate lines of inquiry existed. At the conclusion of the pilot, 68% of A Division officers noticed a positive difference to their workload and 56% felt they had more time to investigate crime reports which had proportionate lines of inquiry. Um, uh, Linda, I'm wondering, we, we're really up against it time-wise and so with, mm -hmm. with your permission, um, if there's anything that you really have a burning desire to say on this, then that's fine. But mm -hmm. would you would you rather right. maybe we move on to the next item? No, which... I'll very quickly say one thing, Brian. Um, I'm glad it's been rolled out. I'm glad that the Justice Secretary has confirmed that officers will continue to investigate all reported crimes. What I would say is that I'm absolutely stunned that this needed a pilot study to do something that's very, very sensible. Um, all people want in a lot of cases is to know what's happening. So if there's no um, response that can be made, if there's no lines of inquiry, tell people, don't keep them hanging on for ages and ages. So that's all I would say. Stunned that it's taken this length of time to get to what seems to me to be a very sensible way forward. Thank you, Linda. So the last item of this evening is women and girls in Malawi, Rwanda and Zambia will be given the opportunity to design and deliver a new fund to advance gender equality and the rights of women and girls in their own countries. The new Women and Girls Fund is supported by £3 million from the Scottish Government's International Development Fund and will be delivered over four years. The lead delivery partner for the fund is the international research consultancy ECORIS, working in collaboration with the FAWE, which is the Forum for African Women Educationalists, in three of the Scottish Government's international development partner countries. 
The fund will take a participatory approach, being co-developed by women and girls and women and girl-led organisations in the three countries. International Development Minister Kolkab Stewart said, Gender inequality remains one of the greatest human rights, rights challenges globally and we must work together to address this. Reflecting our commitment to equalise power, the Women and Girls Fund will provide direct support to local women and girl-led organisations in our sub-Saharan African partner countries. Um, I'm tempted to go straight to the questions for you, um, Linda. Yeah. So um, I assume this has been time to coincide with International Women's Day, which is tomorrow, yeah. um, the 8th of March. Um, and uh, so uh, this is the, exactly the kind of um, development that shows that it's important. I mean, we earlier on in the show, we had, were talking about the Emma Caldwell case and the appalling mm -hmm. um, misogyny uh, um, and Governor Hill Bath's got a programme of events for International Women's Week and the National Tomorrow has been put together by a completely male team. The men have all been told to stay at home. Um, I'm trying to be quick as I can to let you have more time. What, what do you say? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's why it's been announced now. What, what I would say is I'm very proud of the Scottish Government's International Development Programme, but we should never forget that this is additional to what we contribute uh, through the UK International Development Programme, which of course has been cut over the years. The, the Scottish Government one is particularly good because it goes direct and people design their own programmes as within this one. Um, it, you know, it doesn't go to governments, it goes directly on the ground where it's needed and required. And this sounds to me, three million over four years, um, doesn't sound an awful lot of money. Um, but it's a lot to these organisations to try and make things better for women in their own country. Women and girls who are very disadvantaged um, across the world generally, but more so in many of the developing nations. And this, this um, Scotland's relationship with African countries in terms of aid yeah. and development, it's a long-standing tradition, isn't it? Yeah, well, there's a very special relationship with Malawi. Uh, and that's been ongoing more or less since the Parliament started. Um, it was Jack McConnell and George Reid uh, that brought that into being. And, you know, it has expanded over the years. Zambia, for example, um, has a, a history with Scotland uh, over a couple of centuries. Rwanda surprised me, I have to say, because there's not a, a big Scottish link with Rwanda. But, uh, you know, I absolutely trust those who decide where these programmes go. Uh, so, yes, it's good news for women in these countries. That's great. Thank you. And of course, we hope to be covering International Women's Day fully tomorrow on, here in Scotland at seven. So, well, that's it for this evening. But before we go, I just want to remind you that here at Broadcasting Scotland, we depend on the generosity of our supporters. Our programmes will always be free to view. However, if you can afford £5 a month, please do consider becoming a Broadcasting Scotland supporter. We have now reached our emergency crowdfunder target of £10,000. So to everyone who's donated and to everyone who has signed up to make a regular payment, we thank you very much. Our focus will now move on to securing the future of independent broadcasting for Scotland by growing our subscri subscriber base and regular funding. But once again, my huge thanks to Linda Fabiani. Linda, thank you for your patience with me. Um, <laughs> and Pleasure. for No, seriously, it's hugely um, um, appreciated. Um, I'll let you get on with the rest of your evening and I'll just say goodbye and thank you to those at home for watching. Goodbye. Thank you.